children well Cause their father's hell Did slowly go by And feed them on your dreams The one they fix The one you know by so we're going to start with just a little bit of culture as people gather, and usually we start at like 105. So this is a piece that Adam performed, and I cut it into a video, but plus it's a super awesome poem. And then, um, then Patrick will continue if that's okay. All right, it's called Old Two Roads Lead Here. Uh, let me start with a poem and then I'll sure. do a song. So um, this is a poem I wrote just recently. Um, it's called All True Roads Lead Here. To organize around your dream, to trust in some angelic scheme, to write and sing the songs you hear, all true roads lead here. <laughs> the rat infested tents and streets, the land where plundering repeats, the fight to make the river clear, all true roads lead here. The books that rip the lies to shreds, the networks of a million threads, the star that calls to persevere, all true roads lead here. The neighbor with no funds to eat, the empty houses down the street, the nerve to make your prayer sincere. All true roads lead here. Oh, That's awesome. I just love that poem. All right. Yes. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. Any great way to kick it off. At the end, I know, right? Yeah. Welcome, everyone, to today's discussion um, on, on COVID-19 kids and, say, and uh, school safety. Um, my name is Patrick with the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about what we do, who we are a little bit later towards the end of the program. Um, and um, I'm gonna kick it off now to our, uh, our moderators, my comrade Jesus Estrada and uh, Juanita Del Toro. Awesome. So thank you everybody. We are so privilege and honor to have um, union and parent organizers in such a crucial topic. And one of the things I hope we can focus on in this conversation is not just what you've been doing to fight for these demands, but what what is your vision of a truly safe school? You know, what does that look like? Um, so we are very honored to have Michelle Gunderson and I will have you introduce yourself a little more. We have Miss Anastasia, I'm gonna butcher your last name, sorry, let me see, Ch Chapita. Chapital. Chapital, thank you. And we are also joined with Adam Ladlier, who is a delegate with the Chicago Teachers Union. And they all bring various experiences, but um, they're, they're inspiring. So I hope you get a lot out of this conversation. So they're going to speak for about 10 minutes and then we're gonna have a cultural break and then we'll open it up for discussion. So Michelle, do you wanna start us off? Hello everybody, welcome. I'm Michelle Gunderson. I'm a trustee with the Chicago Teachers Union and a vice president with the Illinois Federation of Teachers. And through those roles, I've been very closely um, working on what it looks like to open up schools. And last July, I worked on the governor's commission um, through the Illinois State Board of Education on the reopening plan. Think about last July, we were only having 400 cases a day. And what we were thinking about actually seemed kind of reasonable. The problem is the virus is not reasonable and our world is not reasonable. Um, we have too many children who did not have um, enough resources in order to be able to do the remote teaching and learning well. And we also had um, parents wanting their children into buildings too soon. And so the thinking through what school could look like when the health and safety of our communities wasn't at such a high risk is much different than where we are now. And for me, um, talking about what makes a school safe 
is a school that takes into consideration all the peoples who enter the school. And one of the things that I've had problems with is how easily teachers have been put up as collateral, as, as uh, possible damage in all of this. I'm 60 years old. I've been teaching for 34 years and the Chicago schools haven't kicked me out yet or made me leave. But I don't think that we've taken into consideration um, all of the peoples who come into our schools, their conditions, their abilities, or their needs. And um, I also think we don't, hadn't taken into consideration how many of our families are doubled up or multi-generational. And the push to go back into schools with huge amounts of resources being used to make this happen, where the community, 70% of it has said, no, that's not for us, actually was a misguided direction of resources, time and energy. So how do I see safe schools? I see safe schools when we can stay at home for a little while longer, so more people can be vaccinated, so more people can stay safe. As a leader in the Chicago Teachers Union, we had worked to prolong the starting of in-person school. I want to state clearly to everybody that I wish we had gone on strike. I think we'll have a chance to maybe talk about that in our discussion, um, but I do know that every day that we stayed out were less people sick and less people in the hospital. And I've been waiting for Lori Lightfoot, our, mayor, our current mayor, to thank us for that, right? Um, we actually were the ones keeping our communities safe. So those are my opening remarks, and I'm going to pass it on back to you. Looking forward to a robust discussion. Absolutely. Um, Anastasia? Yes, uh, my name is uh, Anastasia Shepardow. Um, Also, friends of mine call me Anastasia or Anna. Um, I'm a CPS mom of two children. Um, I have a son who is 10 years old who um, is a special needs child. Um, he actually is autistic, or as some people say, have autism. So I've been in this fight for a long time with CPS regarding him getting services and um, making sure that everything that is in, in his IEP um, that he's actually receiving. Um, I am also uh, one of the co-founders of an organization newly started called Parent Voices Matter. Uh, myself, along with um, Mr. Joseph Williams and his wife, Jasmine Williams, uh, started this recently because we saw that there was a great need for parents to have a voice. Uh, we have the CTU, you know, the union to speak for teachers. We have um, other organizations that speak for their schools. We have, um, you know, of course, the city of Chicago, they speak for themselves. But who speaks for parents? So um, one of my um, co-founders as well, actually, uh, of an organization, was well, not an organization, it's more like a parent-led movement <laughs> called the Sick Out. Um, and the Sick Out, um, I'm one of the, actually one of the co-organizers of that, where we have been really promoting um, and talk, trying to get the mayor and everyone to talk to us. Like, how can you have these reopening plans without talking to us parents? You know, we are the parents. If I tell my child she or he's not going to school, whether it be in person or online, they're not going. So parents, we have the power. So our whole thing about the sick out, which we have upcoming on March 1st, is to just give a voice to parents. If you want your children to stay at home, that's fine. We support that. If you want your children to go to school um, online and stay remote, you know, full time, we support that. We just want parents to have a choice and for the choices to be uh, better than what is being seen. So my stand put on education, when it comes to the curriculum, when it comes to just education in general, my family has been fighting this for over 50 years. Uh, my great grandfather was the president of NAACP in New Orleans for almost 10 years. And he fought it for civil rights, for human rights, for uh, labor rights, for teachers. So the, the, no matter what state you're in, even 40, 50 years later, we're still going through the same thing. You know, so parent voices being heard is why I'm here. 
um, because we need more unity with the parents, the teachers, the organizers, community. We need more of that, and we're just not having it. So uh, for me, where I stand or where everyone from the sick out to the parent voices matter, um, even when we've been um, aligning ourselves with even Raise Your Hand, uh, which is another organization, we're all in this together. All parents of all walks of life, all cities, all backgrounds, creeds, religions, we don't care. If you're a parent or a caregiver, we want you to help us, uh, support us in having a voice at the table to actually mean something. So that is pretty much my background. That's where I'm coming from. I'm an uh, ordinary parent <laughs> um, who just uh, wants a voice. You know, I have a voice and I've been vo advocating for my son and other children for many years. However, we need to take this to the next level. And to me, the next level is us unifying in every state, um, here in the United States, every, even other countries. Like, I want this to go global, where we're not just going to stop right here because, again, parents have been, to me, overlooked and neglected for years. Uh, we, are, we don't really matter. <laughs> You're just a parent. You know, discussions made on our children, you're just a parent. But again, we're the first teachers, um, and we're going to always, you know, have our children back more than anybody else. So thank you um, for inviting me, Jesus. And um, you can go out, pass it back on to you, and you can introduce the next person. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank, thank you for those remarks. And uh, Autumn, you want to go next? Hi everyone, um, I'm Autumn Laidler. I am a teacher in Chicago Public Schools at National Teachers Academy, um, which is in the South Loop. And um, I'm really happy to be here. And I think the two people before me really laid out a really important um, foundation for why we should all be here and care about this. And I think, um, I love that Michelle said that she wished we had an opportunity to go on strike because I think the key that has, has gotten us to this point has been the safety that um, stakeholders have demanded. And I say stakeholders because I think parents have demanded that through how they've opted out um, of returning to school. I think teachers have demanded that through um, the collective action of their, of their union membership. Um, and I think one of the parts that's been, been really challenging uh, for me and, and for other folks who have uh, had a lens on things like equity for a little bit of time um, is that this pandemic has caused us to all see the deep inequities um, that exist in, in Chicago public schools. And um, the fact that the mayor is using that in a, a really blatantly offensive way now to reopen schools um, is really hard to take. And I think um, when we think about equity and we think about who should be centered, um, I think the Chicago Teachers Union tries to center our most vulnerable when they fight for homeless students and families. I think our parents are fighting for our students who need and deserve their special education services uh, met legally. Um, and I think when we ignore those who should be prioritized in equity, um, we are missing a, an opportunity to really reshape um, our community schools. Um, I love that parents um, are organizing in every way they can. I think the teachers union has been one of the um, strengths for me to feel supported and, and fighting for what um, is best for our community um, and, and listening to parents and trying to partner with parents. Um, and I think systematically it's really, it's a real challenge to do, but um, you know, I've been back this week. Uh, I haven't been teaching for as long as Michelle, but I've been back this week and I'm at a school that um, I'm sure like every school is going to be facing some staffing issues. Um, we're facing staffing issues before any K through eight children have been in the building. Um, I'm going to be teaching simultaneously, which means that I'm teaching the kids who are at home and, and the kids in person at the same time. And I can tell you, um, I'm not a great remote teacher. Uh, I'm, I'm new at it, but I can promise you I'm a better remote teacher than I am a hybrid teacher where I'm having to teach children before me and children at home. Um, and I think about how ignored um, communities were and how ignored parents were um, when we think about who we serve. And I use that word um, really strategically. We do serve 
um, our children and families and, and the fact that we're ignoring um, the people that we're here to serve. Um, and quite frankly, Chicago Public Schools has been ignoring communities we serve. Um, we don't have counselors and social workers and we don't um, support our homeless students and our special ed families have gone to court and to the state to have their um, children receive legal services. Um, I think this just magnifies the disservice um, our school district um, continues to do in our communities. And, and so when we think about COVID and, and all of this, I'm, I'm so thankful for um, Karen Lewis's leadership that she provided and that I think our union continues to um, follow in her vision when we think about the schools that our students deserve. Um, and I think that fight is righteous. And I think it's, uh, it's important that we keep our um, eyes on that on that goal because the detours that our mayor has provided um, to reach those things that we know our, our families and kids deserves has been um, something we all have to push back against. Um, and when I think about you know what it means to have a safe return, I think um, Michelle pointed this out at the beginning, right? When they're making a plan in July and, and looking at a number and then you're looking at a plan in October, November, January even. Um, and so I think one of the things that was really hard uh, when we were fighting to remain remote and improve remote learning was this idea that we didn't want to return. Um, and the concept is not that we don't want to return, we want to return when it's safe. Um, and safe means a lot of things. And so, you know, when families overwhelmingly don't believe it's time yet to send our family, our kids back, we have to listen to that. Um, when parents say we're not ready to send our kids back, our next question should be, how do we do better for your family? Um, if it's not opening schools, then what does it look like? Um, the fact that we're opening schools for a specific contingent of white and affluent families uh, should tell us all something um, in this moment and how much money and effort is going to serve those folks, why we ignore um, other communities and other people. And I think um, when we think about what it means to be safe, uh, there's a variety of things and I'm, I'm grateful that the Chicago Teachers Union did put some things in place that weren't because um, we were going back with three masks and a bucket of wipes before uh, collective action happened and, and there's more safety um, currently in place. Um, but I will tell you one of the most unsafe things is that our schools are not staffed appropriately um, in this moment. Um, Chicago Public Schools, I got an email on Thursday that said they were looking to hire um, adults to supervise children, contact families. Um, so when you're putting that out on a Thursday and you got 60,000 kids coming back on a Monday, uh, that doesn't feel safe. So I think um, when people demand safety, having like those demands and knowing what that looks like is really important and listening to, um, if we say we're centering equity, we need to center the most vulnerable in our community. So um, that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm working towards in my work. Um, with teachers at my school and, and as we continue to try to listen to the most vulnerable in our community. Outstanding. So Adam says, thank you Anastasia and Adam for bringing our attention to the needs of the most oppressed, vulnerable, marginalized. This is the right ground to stand on for this conversation. Excellent. And he had given you props earlier, Michelle. So uh, beautiful, beautifully said. Um, so we're gonna just uh, have Lou per perform a piece that deals with education. And then we're going to open up for a conversation. I'm not sure uh, whether you know how many of you have heard this before. Uh, Michelle might have heard this before. This was written after the 1912 strike of the teachers union, probably while it was going on. You said 1912. Did I? Well, I, I'm older than I look. <laughs> I love this poem. Um, and I just want to make sure that everybody understands that although it doesn't start out with something that looks like it's about education, it really is. The, the uh, title is This Thumb, This Hand, This Union. I printed business cards, 10 up on ochre parchment, cardstock laid three sheets of the copy on the paper cutter, lined the paper even on the surface grid, and sliced the paper on the hash marks again 
Again, until I position the paper for the final cut and raising the blade high, slashed hard on my thumb with a scream. The blade edge was duller than I thought. The paper it went through blocked the full force. Ice kept the swelling down, slowed the bleeding, sped the congealing. Even so, my painful, bleeding, swollen thumb, still connected to the hand, could not oppose my fingers to pull a renegade hair or slice a mango, grasp a sheet of paper fallen on the floor. This thumb, this digit connected through the hand, both to the fingers and to the brain, this body, this union of function and action, this operating machine works together only after years of working together. I've honed to a habit, the practice of carving a mango. Skilled always the same, the brain, the body united, the plan, the activity, the plan, the strike action, many years prepared, habit formed the sinews, the muscle, the nerves built to connect parent and teacher. The picket line stretches out in front of Gail's school, a red-shirted sea ebbs and flows at the entrance. Other red shirts sent to Clark and Howard wave to passing motorists, truck drivers, parents, students honk support, and picket captains hold meetings at every school asking teachers what they think. A union is an organism, a body, fingers, thumbs, hearts, brains, all fight in concert. They challenge a corrupting disease that cripples how teaching works. A union is a body, a people is a body, a brain, a hand, a heart. With a strike, the body and brain get set for coming battles. Parry that blade, blunt that cut made by profit monger millionaires and miscreants. Clear the path to take control away from that ragtag collection of political scum that care nothing for our children, our people, our body. Thank you. Yay! That was beautiful. All right, so we can okay. open up to uh, discussion. And Juanita, if you have any questions or panelists, if you have questions for each other. Um, so I, I guess Michelle had mentioned earlier that, uh, and I think a lot of us are in agreement that you, there was a desire to go on strike. And what I know hindsight is 2020, Street but people. thank you. Sorry, my husband, <laughs> who should be watching. Um, <laughs> what, maybe if you could speak to that, Michelle, because I think that's a really important point. And like as outsiders, we were observing what was happening on the inside. Um, and then we know a lot of work went into just the fight in general, but what maybe could have happened as a result of and, and maybe speak to that. You know, I hate um, historians that do counterfactuals, you know, the, those what if stories, but um, Lou, thank you very much for your poem, especially that they care nothing for us for, for what is us. And I, if I'm going to talk about the strike or um, how we collectively worked together. I think we all need to know as people who are broadening out the, the left that we can't keep asking the same workers to take on the struggle. And we had about 50 workers who had been hit really hard with this. They were the ones that were um, called back into the buildings January 4th. And the people that you saw teaching from outside, the people you saw, like Dennis Kosuth, our school nurse, who refused to go into a building and kept day after day making his case. Kirsten Roberts, who was singing, who said, I want to teach, like Autumn said, but was outside. And um, as much as I love our union and I love our power, um, 
if we're going to broaden the left and broaden what workers can accomplish, it can't always be on us. And I think that I feel sometimes as a leader of the Chicago schools, that the nation and the, the, the international workers un, unions look to us maybe um, too much. And I would like to, um, in all of this work, we need to see how can we make us stronger by having more of us always, right? That's, that's what it means to guide revolution and have revolutionary thought. But I, I do want us to think about how much we did ask of uh, very few people in our union. And then I also want us to think about the hardest organizing I have ever done was keeping my members from my own building home and teaching remotely when they were being um, threatened and criticized and controlled daily by our bosses to go in so much harder than a strike. <clears throat> and um, because the strike, the line is drawn, you don't cross the line. And we did at my school um, have 10% of our teachers go in, even at my school, which I think is a Florida ceiling union organized school. Um, and, and I think we need to look at that. that the union's numbers are 90% of us remained remote, but 10% of, 10 of us did go into buildings. And part of my analysis is this is not a contract fight. This was not even about wages and benefits or our working and learning conditions. This was so highly politicized. The disease itself is so highly politicized. We have um, members in our building, I call teachers members, members of our union, um, who are anti-maskers, everyone. We have a teacher who is a COVID denier. And then we had two other teachers who are Trump supporters. And so you can see that this is much, much different than a contract fight. In our 2019 strike, those people were on the picket line and adamantly on the picket line because this was about their personal life. But now we're asking them to take action against their personal belief. And it was really different. So I have no easy answers about this, but I do want to call out Lou, thank you so much because I do believe they do. They care nothing for us. They can care nothing for our physical body, or what this is doing. It is crushing. It's inhumane. What we have been asked to do. Um, actually, I, a better word. It's been dehumanizing to me to be treated as collateral damage, and to also be asked to perform miracles daily, and to clean up huge huge amounts of their messes. So as I see this forum as um, how are we broadening the left? How are we, how are we taking care of workers as well as everybody else in our community? How do we consider people who work in education as workers, as the, as the people who put forward this labor and this fight? And um, my last remarks about this uh, strike and what it takes to go on a strike is that having led three strikes in the Chicago Teachers Union it takes months to build that solidarity. It takes months of understanding before people are willing to do it. And um, though I think our world would be a different place and internationally teachers would be in a better place if we had the power to strike, I really do. But am I going to vilify people during a national pandemic who are worried about their health care? who are being threatened with their job and loss of pay. You know, we were being threatened with loss of pay for work we had already done, for the remote teaching we've already done. And many of us have housing insecurity, food insecurity, health insecurity. I, I cannot vilify our leadership or any union sibling who felt like this was not the time that we were strong enough to strike. And I can be with Autumn, they were giving us three cloth, bad quality masks, and a bucket of um, sanitizing wipes that they told us to cut in half before our union took its stand. You agree with me on that one, Autumn? Okay, so thank you for giving me a chance to explain it. I think, I don't think in any news media or any forum that we've actually mourned and talked about in a, in a, um, in a relevant and careful way, 
what it meant not to go on strike. Mm -hmm. No, I agree 100%. Um, does anybody want to respond to those, uh, Autumn or, or um, um, Anastasia or Anna? Sorry, Anna. And then we have uh, Steve on stack. So my husband just dropped off masks to the school. And I was like, are they not providing the mask? Like what's going on, you know? So, I, but I think that's for sure. Go ahead, Adam, I, I saw you on mute. Yeah, I would just um, obviously echo, um, you know, the organizing around uh, this is very different than any organizing um, that people have done because although safety is a part of what we fight for as workers, just in a general sense, right? Um, this was a very different understanding of what it means to be safe. And I think um, the other part um, that was really challenging too was, um, and this is less to do about striking, but um, more to do with like that inequity pieces. Um, Michelle and I were joking earlier that we've never actually met in real life, but we are on Twitter together. Um, and one of the things I've seen come out of this is that people who have, uh, rarely, let me use that word, rarely experienced an inequity are, are screaming at the top of their lungs that they feel um, they're suffering in an inequity. Um, teaching in Chicago public schools, um, we shut down in the spring every year to test children in multiple ways, state testing, city testing. Um, you, people have been clamoring about the learning loss that their, their babies are suffering in wealthy suburbs. Um, that's an achievement gap in a city, y'all. Like that's the same, we, we're talking about it differently. And we drill and kill kids in small groups to get them caught up to close the achievement gap. Um, when people are talking about their access to school and their children need to be in school, have never once fought for kids who have been suspended, expelled or arrested at school, who are excluded regularly. Um, so I also feel like um, in this conversation, it has to be broadened um, when, because I think Michelle's point about broadening for workers, we need to broaden um, people who care about education. Um, if you didn't give a shit about kids in the achievement gap or kids being excluded because cops are in their schools, but now you do because you want your kid from Elmhurst to be in school and they're missing out and they're being excluded, we have to, to bridge that and say, no child, you're right. No child should suffer a learning loss. No child should be remediated because of learning loss and, and really talk through how these things are, are, are coming to be understood. Learning loss and the achievement gap are from the testing companies. Those are not necessarily educator uh, learning ideas. Um, and so when we fight back, um, I think when we think about what it means to provide safe and equitable education, we also have to broaden the conversation because if all we're going to do in this moment is say a building is safe or a building is not safe, I also think we're missing an opportunity. All right, so we have Steve uh, on stack. Steve? Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, um... I just want to read from today's newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, which the headline is that CDC urges caution as cases rise in the US. And our friend uh, Rochelle Walensky, who claimed the schools can open any old time, no problem. Teachers don't need vaccines, not to mention everybody else, uh, says these times are tenuous. Now is not the time to relax restrictions caution with reopening but she's not talking about the schools that's a scam as far as i can tell um every we're supposed to worry about opening nail parlors but schools can open no problem uh it, it's just terrible uh the uh the real thing is that as long as there's community spread you can't really have safe schools uh and just out here, it's just the same as you guys are talking about. The uh, schools from higher income areas have very low levels of COVID spread. And the areas in the flatlands of Oakland, which is where the poor people live, have high, very high levels of spread. Uh, easily like Los Angeles, one third of the kids either have been exposed or they carry 
the virus with them and will expose you. Um, that's just the reality. And, and I, I want to note also uh, in New Zealand, uh, where they had almost no COVID, uh, they have had total shutdown in the capital because one person brought in COVID. That's the way you handle this business. And of course, those parents and families are receiving money from the government at about 80% of their income level. So they're being paid not to go to school and not to work. Um, the, uh, uh, the real problem I see is uh, that the corporations have chosen not to share their, uh, their uh, vaccine formula as intellectual property. They keep it as you know, private property for themselves. And because of that, we don't have enough vaccine. And because there's not enough vaccine, everybody is all of a sudden driven into what is essentially a manufactured crisis. Uh, and I have to say that the Biden administration is, does not have clean hands on this one. Uh, I wish they did, <laughs> given what the option was, but uh, uh, they are participating in selling this and weaponizing parents against teachers. We see that out here too. And it's exactly the same economic strata of parents who are uh, forming up to demand the schools are open without any consideration for families who are just barely making it. And, and frankly, the schools of those families, we have elementary schools out here, two of them of over a thousand kids in an elementary school for it. That's around here, that's unheard of. Uh, and those are families of essential workers, that those schools are in communities where community spread is going on regularly and they're supposed to reopen it. Just, uh, it's just wrong. And this has become a political process like you guys have noted. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Steve. So Anastasia, I think it's good timing. I think you really have something important to say here. So we'll let you go yes. next. <laughs> thank you. You know what? Um, wow. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you, Lou. Thank you, everyone. OK, let's, let's just keep it real. The reason why we're having this discussion more than anything is systematic racism. Let's talk about that. It's, it's, it's systematic racism. The reason why some areas have more funding than others, this is nothing new. You know, we go back to the Alderman, we go back to the TIF money, we go back to the, the Treasury Department, you know, funds from, from communities that are considered low income or more black and brown people, you know, that live there. Those funds are, generated and sent us elsewhere. They're sent down to Springfield, to other cities and places, to beautify, to uplift, you know, to improve the education, things like that. Those dollars are not spent in the neighborhood that they're accumulated. They're actually gathered and accumulated yet. So that's one problem. Another problem is number one, they you know have this whole thing about trying to turn us parents or make it seem as if we're not for the teachers. We are 100% behind the teachers. We're on this, we're with them. We're fighting with the teachers. So everyone who, who I'm affiliated with, as far as the stick out team, which we're doing Monday, because we know regardless of what happens, they're gonna still keep doing this. Uh, we have the uh, Raise Your Hands, we have other organizations, we have the Parents uh, Voices Matter, the one that I'm a co-founder of. We're all voicing our opinions and saying we support teachers because, and we love our teachers. Okay, I want my children to be in school, in person. However, just like everyone said, because, and I love the poem that Lou did, he said, we're all one body. So, you know, the hand, the leg, you know, the head, everybody's important. You can't say, well, you're not important because you're just the arm. Okay, talk to people who have one arm or no legs. I know people who don't have, you know, can't function or don't have certain things to be able to do or your brain or something or your body. Any part that is out of whack or missing will affect your whole way of thinking, meaning that it, it, it does matter. It's important. So when you exclude one part of the body and say, oh, well, we'll deal with you later. Oh, it's never going to, your body's never going to function properly. So this is like a disease <laughs> that has been spread out through America. 
it's not even just a Chicago thing. It's not just a city thing. This is an American issue. Anytime American, anytime you have, you know, a president that was elected to tell students or tell parents, you know, oh, your, your children can't be here because of citizenship when you, I mean, when, are you kidding me? Most of our families are immigrants. Most of, including the ones who are talking about, you know, it's, it's amazing to me, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> we make up America, all of us do. You know, so again, the systematic racism doesn't just stop with education, it's all over in every kind of, every area, every area of everything. Education is what we focus on now, but again, Let's go back to what is education? What's the re why do we send our children to school? For education, to learn something and learn what? Learn something or learn specific things, to learn social emotional skills, to uh, learn science, to understand the world, to develop their minds and as well as also how to think. So when we have a, a group of individuals who are leading, the educational system when they say things like oh well your opinion doesn't matter when you teach your children your opinion doesn't matter uh about their children's safety we have to look at everything including the fact that what they're even they're feeding our children i'm looking at my the lunches and stuff in my twitter school i was like who approved this stuff you know there are other countries that say you know what well, our children don't uh there are countries that say our children or our country doesn't agree with certain chemicals certain foods and things, you know, we're going to ban it. It's banned everywhere, but America say, sure. <laughs> well, we don't care. We, no one's going to get profit from it. That's all that matters. You know, so we're dealing with, again, systematic racism, not just education. It's everything related to this country. I, I'm, I love being American. However, <laughs> when we're talking about these discussions, we have to look at there are so, there are so many layers to all of this, I mean, give an example. Most of the schools on the South side, my children, well, my son, I just transferred him last year to a cluster program, even though he's at home remotely. Um, but my daughter goes to a school that is over 1,100 students on the South side of Chicago. Be Beasley is a classical school. It's a, uh, one of those classes, I know it's traditional. It's a magnet school, it's a gifted school. And it's awesome. However, <laughs> When's the last time, you know, do they put money into get, letting them clean, clean the vents? When's the last time vent, ventilation systems on most schools before the COVID hit were even clean? Teachers were complaining, including students are getting allergies and things like that. So there were problems way before COVID hit that weren't addressed. And they're not going to address them. They keep telling us we've done all we can for remote learning. Really? Mayor of Chicago currently? I don't know if not in the future, but not right now, the need a barrier. And you're saying that that's all you can do? I have parents and friends of mine that I know who have no choice, including teachers, because there are a lot of teachers that are also parents that have to keep their children either at home or some of them have to make to have them go to school, but they can't work Monday through Friday because they only have them in school two or three days a week. So it's like, okay, how does that benefit? a mother or parent or family who has to work five days a week, Monday through Friday, you know, or whatever, you know, how does that happen? And people think that everyone has a support system. Everyone does not have a strong support system. You can't have everyone watch your children. I can't have everyone watch my children, especially my son. Okay. So it's like, they don't care about these things. Everybody said that they just don't care. So we're on here today because we're showing that we care and we're like, we're gonna do about it. I don't want to, we're not just talking, we need solutions. Okay, so everybody I talk to, including on this platform, is all about solutions because everybody agreed they do not care. It's about the almighty dollar, <laughs> it's about the money, it's about the revenue. They don't care about our teachers getting sick, taking it to their children, taking it to their families. They don't care about the community, how it's gonna affect the community. They don't. You know, so it's like, what are we going to do? Because, again, we, we, we were fighting for our teachers, you know, and it's like, so that's why our parents have come together, because we're like, 
we're sick of it. <laughs> we're sick and tired of not only having a voice, but we're sick and tired of them treating you all and us, treating teachers and parents like we don't we don't matter, treating us like crap. Even the mayor had the nerve to say that she was the voice of parents. <laughs> what the hell? Voice of what parents? What in, what parents? She's not my voice. She's not the voice of no one in our sick out team. And we're composed of all kind of backgrounds. She's not the voices, parent voices matter. Uh, any other organization affiliated with or connected to uh, you all on here. She does not speak for us. Okay. So we're tired of the lies, the lying over and over again. Lying. Lying to say, well, yeah, yeah, we did that. Yeah, yeah we did. It's like, <laughs> so I have to kind of laugh because if I don't, I get very upset and angry. I literally, I would be that so-called angry black woman, you know, because it's, it's like, you see the pain that others go through. You know, you have to have empathy for them. You know, there are a lot of children that are sick right now that they won't tell you that they're sick because of the pre the opening that they already did. Parents who children on their deathbed, they're not going to tell you that. And I'm one of those parents that I do believe in freedom of speech, but I also believe in freedom of choice. And my choice is my children are not going back until maybe no earlier than September. And I don't agree, but I don't think the vaccine is, is, is viable for me and my children now. Okay, due to besides systematic racism, I am terrified of the fact that the vaccine being so short notice, you know, I'm an alum from also here in Washington, <laughs> as well as Chicago State. I have a couple of degrees in science as well as business and uh, marketing and, you know, business administration. And I started my master's in management as well as also um, in education. So my goodness, regardless of what I have far as on paper, that's not going to save you from getting COVID. I have friends that are vegans. Guess what? They got COVID. COVID does not care. I pray every day for everybody. Because for me personally, you never know what you do if it's going to be enough. But when you have a system that don't care about the basic stuff, we're just asking for the basic things for our teachers and for our, our children. And when they tell you that you don't deserve it because of where you live or the color of your skin or because of the history of this country has been known to not care about anyone except themselves. That's it. We've had to fight for everything that we have and it's still not enough. So um, I think I've said plenty. Um, like again, I'm just sick and tired. <laughs> I'm, I don't want to be sick anymore, but I'm, I'm still a little tired, okay, because sick is not good. But, you know, again, I'm one of those parents who don't um, feel like the vaccine is, good, you know, good for my child right now. And I'm concerned about in the fall that they say all the teachers have to be vaccinated and, and they try to say, well, all the students as well, I'm going to be homeschooling, honey. Mm. That's just what it is. I just have to, you know, do what I have to do. Um, pull together whatever resources we have and make it happen because, again, this is our this is our lives. I'm not going to gamble my children's lives like a roll of dice, like ru Russian roulette. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> they may he may or may not get it. You know, maybe. You know, maybe it doesn't work for me. It doesn't. You know, and it hurts. It really does. It hurts to know that seventy something years later, people are still fighting, even after my grandfather, my great grandfather. People are still fighting for educational rights, human rights, mm -hmm. human rights, educational rights, <laughs> labor rights to be treated like, you know, like, my God, teachers, how are you going to be on? You, I, I watched my son's teacher does it. And, and I was like, give him kudos, you know, when he's on there and stuff. And but but I have to go deal with also depression. My son, you know, the children have been, they, they, sometimes they have tantrums, they get depressed, they get stressed out, they get overwhelmed. You know, oh, children shouldn't be online for no more than two hours at a time. But you're okay with six or seven hours, eight hours? <laughs> it's okay for seven hours. You know, it doesn't matter, then you don't care. So I take my children out sometimes because I'm the parent. I have the first and the last say so. 
We need to empower more parents that they have the power to say no. No, my child's not going to be online for 78 hours. And I dare you try to fail them. I dare you try to so-called push teachers to a point where they have to, whatever, when their children have not been online for the whole year, not just this year, but last year, because they either can't get the internet service, some people are homeless, some people have not become homeless, since COVID, it's a lot of things going on that CPS don't know about and don't care about. So, hey, y'all, this is just the beginning. This is a, the continuation <laughs> of, of a, another fight that we've already been doing. And I'm at a point where I'm tired of talking about it. I'm, I'm tired of talking about it. I'm just about to go to, like, I'm online and just blowing up online, <laughs> everything. Because we need to have a voice. And that's it. It's just solutions. We, we come up with these great solutions and things like that. And when it's all said and done, who's listening? You know? So like I tell people, I don't care who you pray to. If you don't pray at all, we all need to come on one accord and pray for the hum, human race. That's really the support. Because besides what's going on in education, there are so many other things that these decisions are all affecting and based around. And we may not see the results right now, but it's coming. It, it's, it's definitely coming, honey. You know, it's definitely coming. So, um, and if we don't support one another, who, who else will support us? Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Anastasia. You're getting props. Uh, Adam says, uh, thank you. You said it, human rights, the basics. We need, we deserve life, not death. And earlier, um, I think it was to one of your earlier points, it was, Adam asked a question like, um, why do we send our kids to schools? It's a very complicated question. So we have um, Peter on stack. Yeah, thank you. That's a hard act to follow. Anastasia laid down a lot. Um, I'm gonna try and focus this. Uh, first of all, Every speaker and everyone else who's commented makes it so clear to me that we're facing a, a carefully worked out strategy of attack on teachers and parents and students. And it's multifaceted. It ranges from the mayor's messages to the president's messages to Randy Weingarten's messages to the CDC to, to fear of vaccines and support of vaccines and uh, so we need to approach it with that awareness that we're facing that kind of attack and that that several people have said it. Michelle was the first I heard say it. They despise us. They have no use for us. And us is everybody that they don't really need anymore to run their frickin factories and their frickin offices. Um, and so that gives us a point of departure. Uh, Michelle and others have raised these, these difficult situations where you've got Trump voters. Uh, it's a constant attempt to divide us, and that's one of the ways of dividing us. Uh, but all these people, what I note about the Trump voters is they hate the elites. They're not entirely sure who all the elites are or how they got that way, but they hate being despised and they hate being ignored. And that is a common point of, of, of uh, unity. And the fact that those teachers Michelle described as having walked the picket lines before, that's really important. And, and that's very powerful for us if we take that up, take up that common point of who are these, these elites? What are they after? What are they really? They're corporate elites. They're not just anybody. And Trump is part of that. But we got to get down to cases about this. When we get clear on that, we'll have a clearer enemy and we'll have clearer unity. Um, the only other thing I want to add is, is that, and, and I think the, the, the folks in Chicago, not just the teachers, but the parents have shown us all over that it's time to go big or go home. It's time to state what we really need and everything we need. And we're not going to go back to what they call normal. Normal was crappy. Normal was shit. We want, 
we want the same conditions that those wealthy neighborhoods have and those wealthy schools. That means national funding of schools, but it also means everybody in the frickin' country gets the level of income that lets them live a decent life. It means every neighborhood in the country gets the level of support that, that lets them have low COVID rates. Every school in the country gets the same level of support. That goes back to Anastasia's really strong point about systemic racism. Local funding of schools is how systemic racism gets played out. That's why we have poor schools and rich schools and that it keeps us fighting each other. So uh, I think that's enough for me. Awesome, thank you, Peter. So I didn't some yeah, schools are neighborhood centers and they reflect the investments or disinvestment of neighborhoods. Um, but then I, I think one, one other concept that you raised and maybe another, and maybe we can speak to this after the, the next person says their comments is how they're pitting parents against teachers, how even, not just the mayor of Chicago, but how they're weaponizing parents, you know, using this this idea of equity to to bring students back when the conditions aren't safe, you know. But um, Courtney Courtney was on on. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Juanita. I was not planning on contributing today. Um, I was just signing on to listen to what everyone had to say and um, support uh, my co-organizer Anastasia. But I need to take us back to this question that Adam raised and that that Anastasia raised. It's why do we send our kids to school? And I think one of the answers that the mayor and CPS are giving us is we send our kids to school because as the mayor sees it, it's childcare. It's a way to get our workers back into the workforce. And that is what's motivating this whole return. And that's what's motivating them pushing this. It's not like really that we are doing what's best for kids and we're really trying to teach them and, and have them learn because we know kids learn best and kids succeed when there's consistency and when their environment is controlled, right? And when ki kids have that consistency right now, they've been, they're at home, their parents have made the sacrifices needed to make to keep them at home. And um, they, they know what their schedule looks like. They know what to expect. They've built relationships with their teachers. They've built relationships with their classmates. And now with this push, in the middle of the year to, to return some of, I mean, it's taken everything and it's thrown it up into the winds. And yet again, our kids are getting changes, changes in schedules, changes in teachers, changes in class and, and for what? So that some kids can be in the classroom two days a week and still in front of a computer so that all kids receive less education and, and less quality. I, I, it's, it doesn't make sense. Like what we need is our government to step up and we need them, our government to make it possible for kids and parents to do what we need to do to stay home and stay safe. We see that this happens in other places in the world and it needs to happen here. But no, we've got too many corporate interests that are telling Lightfoot, get our workers back in the city, get our workers downtown, get them spending money downtown. That cannot be the impetus for them telling us this is what's best for your kids. No, it's best. What's best for corporate America. It's what's best for Lori Lightfoot. It's what's best for the businesses downtown. It's not best for our kids. It's not best for our families. If they wanted to do what was best for our families, they would make it possible for us all to stay home. So that's, I mean, when I, when I hear like, what are we returning for to school for? We're returning to school for corporate America. Yep, I agree. And I really appreciate your comments about, you know, why are we sending both of you, Adam, you, Anastasia, why are we sending kids to school? And I think you hit it about, you know, because we need a uh, an exploitable labor force. And so what a better, what a better training ground, you know. So good. So we have uh, Adam up next, Adam. My God, thank you, everyone. What an important conversation. So happy to be here. Um, and yes, Anastasia, and thank you, Courtney, for just getting right to the point um, with that last comment. 
what and what Anastasia brought into the conversation that I, you know, was just reiterating in the chat was actually from a parent's perspective, or we could even just say from a human perspective, um, we want our kids to grow. We want our kids to be happy. We want them to learn. We want them to become themselves, to become more fully human, you know, and we want them to be able to contribute to creating a world that is more fully human. So we heard about dehumanizing early in the conversation when Michelle brought it in. And, and I think this is where we can draw the line. It's about the vision of dehumanizing versus the vision of humanizing, you know? And it's not just about schools, it's about the whole world as Peter and, and others have, have said, you know? And oh, there, there's so much. And I, I wanna present, you know, just a couple thoughts in a, and I'll try to do it in an organized way. Um, we've heard so many people say that they don't care about us and it's obviously true. And they, they don't care about learning, you know? They, the corporate elites, um, they don't care about human life, you know? If they cared about learning, why would they be so busy closing public schools and defunding them for decades leading up to this point, right? And now all of a sudden we got to open schools, why? So that the parents can go to uh, what few jobs are left and keep the economy going and they can squeeze as much profit out of us as they possibly can. So, uh, you know, Peter brought up the this strategy of dividing us and weaponizing different sections of, you know, the working class against each other, you know, and, and that's, that's a, as old as, you know, the class struggle itself and, you know, um, uh, but it, we're really seeing it play out in this horribly heartbreaking, painful and ugly way right now. And so I, I think part of what can help us achieve the right kind of unity against that these kinds of division is having you know, a vision rooted in human rights like this conversation has been about, you know, um, and, and, and extending that conversation beyond schools to, you know, uh, healthcare, food, water, environment, um, justice, safety, public safety beyond police and prisons, et cetera, right? Um, I mean, I, we're, we're seeing the same thing in the housing struggle right now, you know, where it's like the housing is treated as a commodity instead of a human right. And so we have 40 million people like at the risk of becoming homeless right now in the middle of a pandemic and they're still evicting people, right? And we talked a little bit about this in our last uh, call um, that I, I got to be a part of, um, you know, uh, l last month in, in this series. And um, so I think out of this spirit of mutual aid, of people recognizing that these are life or death issues and that we need to uh, stand together and form a new kind of union, you know, based on like defending life, um, at all costs by any means necessary is where this this you know unity and movement is coming from um and uh and so i'm really excited by you know anastasia anastasia and um everyone here you know like this kind of conversation of articulating the common points between um parents and teachers and students and and if we if we fight forward with that you know then we can imagine education looking completely different where we don't send our kids to school just because it's part of a machine or an engine that keeps society going which really means just keeping the rich getting richer right while the rest of us are left to fend for our lives um we we can imagine a society where you know, uh, everyone has their basic needs met where we, we, we do what people who study pandemics say we should do when there's a pandemic, not just in our cities, but all over the world. I mean, look at what's happening right now with the World Trade Organization and these patents or, you know, the, uh, the copyright of these vaccines that someone mentioned that earlier, you know, it's like, um, 
you know, as bad as we have it here in the States, we're, we still have it so much better than all these other countries that aren't getting, you know, any vaccines because, you know, it's all controlled by these corporations that, you know, have the freedom to choose where their vaccines are developed and, you know, where they're distributed. And so, so there's no equity. Um, and equity isn't just a matter of like what's right or wrong. It's also a matter of safety for all of us because any, you know, epidemiologist will say that the way to deal with a pandemic like this is to, you know, uh, address, to squash the disease um, and vaccinate as many people as possible in as short a time as possible everywhere. That is, uh, you know, the disease anywhere is a threat to everywhere, right? And so in a sense, that's true about all of these life or death issues, right? And so that's what I, I wanna say. And, and the, 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 the thing that keeps me going and gets me up, you know, is imagining that world where, you know, learning, is free where and by free i don't just mean like you know we have the resources we need but like uh it, it's not like you you're being warehoused you know uh or imprisoned in a in a school you we are choosing how to shape um our communities how to improve our communities we're 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 you know learning like 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 just the basic human instinct to know, to learn, to move outward into our environment, to explore, you know, the planet, outer space, whatever. I mean, you could get like into science fiction with, with this kind of stuff. My point is like, that's what learning should be about, like exploring it and knowing and improving and building up our, our lives. And, and when, you, when you think about it like that, the sky's the limit. It's like, we don't really need schools as we know them anymore if we have a society that's based around human being human right <laughs> we just need these different new forms of learning some of which will look much like traditional schools probably but some of which will totally not you know what what will learning look like after capitalism what that that that's where we need to bring this conversation you know i'm done thank you so Adam raised a really excellent point that she says, uh, the model for students to return has the features of the prison system down to not being able to have free movement of their bodies. And um, yeah, I, I, I oh, oh, crazy. That's why my kids are not going back into the building. You know? So Lou is on stack, Lou. Did he get kicked off? There we go, no, no. After what Adam said, I'm not sure how relevant anything I have to say is. That was really, <laughs> I mean, it, it was right on point. Um, and what what Autumn said in the chat about the uh, about the the schools as prisons, I think, is very very important to understand. Um, I'm, I guess I'm going to start with a little uh, uh, anecdote of of my son in Sullivan High School here in Rogers Park. Uh, he's in his 40s now, so this is a, quite a few years ago. And um, he's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, my wife Diana had uh, accumulated a huge stack of paperwork showing how he was a special needs kid. And this, and he, uh, he came to live with us from from his dad's uh, in in uh, Maryland uh, <clears throat> when he was 14. So he, here he is in in Sullivan High School with this stack of paperwork saying he needs an IEP, and the school basically refused to give it to him, and <clears throat> for a number of reasons, all of which were perfectly good reasons, but CPS just. My, mired in, in whatever uh, kept him out of, of, of that. And he, and he wound up in the streets and, th and that's a whole other story. I'm not gonna go into that detail, but I wanna say that, that the schools that I've grown up in were guaranteed for two reasons. They were, they were an order, now I'm 78. So 
when I was in school, in high school, I was supposed to learn how to get a good job. And jobs were available in those days. <clears throat> those were the days when I could quit a job and, and, and start one to, the next day without having to put in resumes or anything. <clears throat> so, uh, so that was a different time. This is a much different time now when we're talking about uh, something like 20 million people losing their jobs and not going back to work because of the pandemic. And what pressure does that put on the workforce? And what kind of schooling does that call for? It's a whole different situation where, I mean, what, what, what Autumn was talking about was essentially the beginning of the school to prison pipeline. That's, you know, I mean, you're getting practice for being in prison right there. So there's that. But there's the other thing that I want to say that Anna was pointing to, which I think was really crucial, is to look at schooling at this time, in these days, for these conditions. What do we need? You know, everybody tells us, everybody with any, you know, with any sense of science tells us we need to address climate change in some way. Well, can't we unleash the creativity and the enthusiasm and the, the inquisitiveness of young people to begin to even look at these questions and solve them for humanity? Not for whether I'm going to get a good job or not, but how are we as a society going to survive? How are people going to survive? And that and that's certainly something that young people that I've been around are concerned with. And so why not give this, you know, find a method or methods, not a method, but all the methods necessary to unleash the power that young people have. And that's, you know, it seems to me that's what we're doing. I really love what, <clears throat> what um, Courtney and Anastasia said. You know, and, and <coughs> in terms of, you know, what, how, how do we engage the entire community in these kinds of questions? Because they're not just the questions of teaching. They're not just the questions of students, but they're questions for our entire community. And the last thing I guess I want to say is, goes back to the first comments that Michelle said uh, and talking about the small group of, of people that were being put on the line uh, in terms of the question of this upcoming strike or possibility of a strike. And I want to say that, um, that that also poses different questions for us today. I was thinking as the teachers union was talking about a strike and other people were clapping their hands and saying, right on, go ahead and strike. I was thinking, what the hell does a strike look like when you're teaching remote? How the fuck do you carry something like that? Pardon my language, but how do you carry that out? <clears throat> what, what are you actually stopping when you're doing that? How does it, you know, I mean, we talk about strikes as being stopping production, but how do you demonstrate that in a situation like that? And I think that challenges us now because in situations like today, how do, we're talking about how do we engage people in every community, in every church group, in every parent organization um, to come together and to fight not just about your individual battle, not just against your individual school system, but to come together in a political battle for a, <clears throat> excuse me, for a political change that means something fundamentally different. Uh, and, and we have to solve that problem. And I'll shut up now. <laughs> Uh, I think Peter is on strike. I mean, I'm on, on stack. Sorry, that was a <laughs> Peter's on stack. 
I can't go on strike. I'm retired. Um, just so everybody knows, I'm a retired community college machine shop teacher in Oakland, California, Laney College. Um, I just wanted to let people know one reason this is very exciting and heartening to me is that that I, Hesu and I have been working on an article. It's in late draft stages about all of these very questions. And it's heartening because I I think that that we we're doing a pretty good job of hitting on all the things you folks are raising and we want it to be a weapon for you. We don't want you to just read it and say, oh, that's nice. We want it to be something that you can say, post and share. And so when it comes out, I, I'm sure Hesu will let you know and, and we hope that'll be useful. But also you've hit on some points that are we're gonna have to add to it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Peter. So Anastasia, you're up again. Thank you, I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thank you all <laughs> for being patient. My computer rebooted in the middle of Adam's talk and I was like, no, <laughs> it just rebooted. But I'm glad I'm back. Um, I won't be as long as, as before, <laughs> um, but I just wanted to just uh, comment to uh, what Peter said um, regarding to like, how do we do this? And like, how do you strike from a remote computer? Well, us parents have come up with the best way to do that is to use the biggest and greatest resource um, that CPS has, our children. If we parents and teachers are, um, we decide for our children not to be online that day, it affects their numbers greatly. I mean, when we did our sick out last month, um, we um, heard from people that were on the board of directors from CPS and other parents affiliated with um, like other organizations, they literally, uh, they came to one of our meetings and they were on, online and they were like, oh my God, they were so busy looking at the teachers, you know, worried about them striking that they were looking to the right and you all hit them with the left. Like they didn't even have no, no care that the, the, the parents would come together. We were not a threat to them. Like, oh, they're just parents, they're nobody. I, do you understand that our children are the commodity? They are the product. They are children. So <laughs> if we say they're not going to school, they're not going to go online, whatever. Guess what? No one has a job. You can't turn it to the teacher's computers off from them doing remote learning because you're getting mad at them, which is affecting our children because you're in this little battle with them, which is all really about, again, profit and about capital, it's about money. So that's how we can strike. And we're going to do it again um, in a few days. And it's not because um, we're striking for, as far as a parent, we have our own parent strike. We're not doing it just because we want the uh, teachers or anyone else to suffer, even our children. It's because, you know, they say, well, they're at home, they're not doing nothing. They are learning. <laughs> they may not be learning everything on the curriculum over the past year because us parents are also teaching them things outside of that. I don't know about you guys, but, or, you know, you all, have anybody learned how to work Google better? <laughs> like I've learned different things from Google and I'm like, there's a, there's a guy Zoom, we got, we got Google Meet, we got Web. I mean, I have have like about five or six different video apps <laughs> on my phone from all of this. So, and my child and my children, they have learned how to work this like technology, like you won't believe, you know, uploading documents and things like that and send it and how to turn it in and, whatever, you know, researching online and stuff. So I'm, like I said, I'm excited to see the growth my children have had um, and have made over the past year. However, the only way that you can fight them is what they care about the most, which is their money. They get about $6,000 a year for an average student that goes to class every day. I don't know how that's broken down, so to speak. Um, and I think it's actually more than that. And I know it's more than that for special needs children. So special needs children, children under six, uh, they receive more money, more funding from the government um, when they are in school or in class. So that's why they don't care that, you know, that's so we hit them where it hurts. We hit them with the, where they care about, which is their money. So if our children are not online or not in person, they're not getting paid. And that money that they misappropriate anyway, <laughs> they don't have that money to spend anymore. That money is much less than like, are you, you know, so 
that's the only way you can really, really fight them, you know, is to hit them where it hurts, which is in their pockets. Anything else we say, we, we talk about our safety. We talk about uh, teachers and parents' safety. We talk about our principals that's been in there since day one. Our parent principals never left. You know, we got to be concerned about our principals too. You know, so it's like, yeah, our, our fight is pretty simple. <laughs> it's just we have to find ways to be able to mess with their pocket. They need to pay to parents. Parents, parents give parents a micro grant. You know, um, that one of my co-founders of, of Parents uh, Voices Matter, uh, Joseph Williams, has been, um, been pushing for micro grants, parent scholarships, things like that. All this money they put into Chicago uh, Police Department, the, P P the CPD, and it's like, well, where are they doing? They're still carjacking. They're still police brutality. They're still all kinds of things going on. I have friends and family that are on a police force in Chicago and other states. I love my family. I know that they have integrity, and they are just like any other group. There are good cops. There are bad cops. There are good teachers. There are bad teachers. There are good whatever. You know, there's always, you know, room for improvement, no matter what. However, this money for COVID that Chicago received was supposed to go to education, it's supposed to go to our peer, our students, to help the teachers. Our our teachers and our students, our children, were considered essential workers over the past month. That's crazy. They, and, and the reason why I know this is because the, when they were shutting down the same week, they were shutting down the city. They were like, we're shutting down Chicago. You know, we're going to have, you know, quarantine for everybody for the week. But uh, kids can go back to school tomorrow, though. What? So a grown person can't go to a restaurant to order me some food or go sit in and like one of my favorite places to go, you know, and just sit down and, you know, have a good meal or have some wine. I can't go there because it's not safe. But my children <laughs> can go to a classroom that's not been clean or sanitized that has a tabletop purifier, the vents in the, in the, in the air, that actually the mo most important ventilation, I would be more comfortable if they even just clean the ventilation system and forget the little uh, small ones on the table. If you clean the air purifiers from the HVAC, that right there would be a, a, a big plus. They've never done that, you know? So anyway, my children have been coming back and forth <laughs> it's Saturday, so if you see me looking back and forth, that's because they're talking to me, asking me stuff, you know, they're only eight and ten, so they can't, you know, completely fend for themselves. But um, that's why I just want to say that everybody, I, I love everything we want to bring to the table. Thank you, um, Yusufa. Thank you for bringing this to the table, Dr. Strada. You're awesome. You know, thank you so much, Juanita, everybody. Um, I'm not going anywhere, but I just want to say thank you now. Um, that is on my mind. So, <laughs> um, go right ahead. I think Courtney's next, or someone else is speaking after me. Um, I on Staten Island, but I just wanted to say thank you because I, 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 it's difficult, right? Um, and I find it admirable that Anastasia is finding time to organize for their two small kids. It's a lot. Um, so go ahead, uh, Shamako. Yeah, can you guys hear me or see me? Hey. Fine. What up? Um, yeah, I totally did not plan on being in this. I, I completely stumbled into this via Facebook, and it's been great. Uh, thank you all for having this. Uh, yeah, I guess I just wanted to trail off of a couple of points that were made. Um, uh, Lou's comment um, in terms of uh, sort of the purposes that education served uh, earlier in his life. You know, I was uh, I'm doing a study group with a friend of mine um, around this book, Golden Gulag. If you haven't heard of it, I highly recommend it. Um, but it's a uh, it's about sort of the purposes in California um, for uh, the prison industry. And you know, I mean, I think it is incredibly significant uh, and relevant information um, that the uh, a lot of the educational infrastructure that is being disassembled right now um, was established sort of post-World War II, kind of directly as a result of the um, military and industrial welfare state. Um, you know, the economic boom that took place as a result of war, 
um, and sort of the established um, economic, uh, you know, uh, gross domestic product foundation that it created. Um, it was a, a long-term investment the state decided to make. Um, and I think that it is increasingly clear day by day, um, they have divested um, and they are refocusing that uh, those sort of um, uh, economic pillars in places like jails um, and not just jails, but you know, even to consider like what exactly is the economic value to Wall Street of student debt. Um, and it kind of raises this question that I think Adam pointed to um, around uh, education um, as a pro-humanity tool um, versus education as a hustle. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there. I also think, um, and I don't, I don't know if this is like useful or practical, um, but when we talk about sort of dehumanization versus humanization, you know, if it, and, and just for note, like I work security for Amazon, but um, if people like Elon Musk um, and Jeff Bezos were put in their proper perspectives, uh, they wouldn't be viewed as successful business people, they'd be viewed as hoarders. And the reality of the situation is that we are trapped in a scenario, um, and you know, I, uh, I apologize for any uh, stigma I may be disrespecting here, but we're in a scenario right now where the patients are running the hospital. <clears throat> and there's, there's no real, there's no real good concrete reason why some of the things, and, and um, uh, not just COVID, but in general, why some of the policies that our society is operating on are in effect other than people are actually insane. Like these people are actually insane. And I sometimes think we give them almost too much credit because of the power they have. Um, when in fact, we should just be talking about them like they're insane. Like they are, like they are actually unhealthy for our society. Um, like they're dangerous. Um, and like they, you know, I mean, from the most compassionate perspective possible, if such a thing is even appropriate, um, they need help. <laughs> like they need help, man. Um, and uh, kind of last thing I want to throw in here. Um, so it's funny, right? Uh, because, you know, um, Anastasia you know, talked about Google. And this is like a whole nother front of struggle, but relevant as we sort of move into this next curve of things. Um, I think we're, and, and I guess this kind of came up as in terms of thinking of the strike, we are, we are increasingly reaching a stage in the movement where we're going to have to find ways to unite with like open technology struggles. Um, because one of the things that happened or is happening as a result of COVID is that a lot of uh, technology corporations are consolidating power. Amazon's consolidating power, Google's consolidating power. Um, Zoom is now entering the conversation at that level. Um, and that makes that an, an inevitable front of struggle that is gonna be relevant to almost every other front of struggle. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to throw that stuff in there. Uh, again, thank you all for this wonderful event and I'm out. Awesome, thank you, that was brilliant. Um, so Adam says, wow. Shamako, I hope I said that right. You are absolutely right. Thanks for helping me make a shift into compassion. Ruling corporate elites who would rather destroy humanity and the earth and share power are literally insane. Yeah, and I think often we talk about how much money they made off the pandemic, but they're hoarding it, right? I can't even imagine what $200 billion would look like and just a fraction of that could help people get housing, education, you know, vaccines and they would still be wealthy and probably still wouldn't be able to spend their money on their lifetime, you know? So brilliant, very, very well said. I'll see what else. Um, yes, Anastasia says the schools have been used as a prison and pipeline system. Beautiful, beautiful, glad you found us. Okay, yeah. And pointing to that wage gap for sure. And oh, don't get me started. Um, the union busting in these tech corporations too. I mean, it's, it's disgusting, you know, but, um, all right, Steve, go ahead. Steve is on stack. So I wanted to give you guys a sense of Oakland because the game is the same, but the rules are different. 
Oakland is like 500,000 people. We have the fifth largest port in the country. It makes a billion dollars a year in revenue, but it's legally separated from the city and the school board is legally separated from the city. So the school board is broke because we can't use that money. The reason for this is because Oakland from the mid fifties on after the great migration in World War II became increasingly African-American. And so they said, uh, -uh we ain't gonna have that stuff. And so they separated the school district and the port so that one can get rich and the other one can go broke. Uh, we uh, are a small, 500,000 people, small for Chicago, but they intend to close 23 schools here in Oakland before COVID hit. So uh, it's really a real estate plan because the city is, it was before COVID hit, had the largest building boom in the entire country percentage wise. And exactly where they're closing the schools and the poor parts of town is where they're building all these market rate high rise housing, most of which is built to be empty. It's an investment tool for, uh, it's a corporate security uh, for people to invest in. And you walk past these, the, these buildings that are constructed and some of them have no lights on at all at eight o'clock at night because they're empty. Uh, and so uh, the school board, instead of trying to reopen, has no plan whatsoever. And they they just are gonna wait and wait and wait. They, they've had several meetings, they refuse to come up with a plan. And what they're really waiting for is for the school year to end at which point the attrition of school personnel, teachers, bus drivers, uh, office workers, all of that will be so big that uh, they won't be able to reopen in the same way in the fall, which means that these flatland schools will become real estate property. Uh, that the school, which is already the school district is the largest landowner in Oakland. So these guys are marketing schools as places to build condos and things like this. Uh, and this is the way that the same procedure is breaking down here. I just wanted to share it because uh, we're all in the same battle, but it takes a different face and in different places. So Autumn was saying that this is the same playbook here. I don't know, do you wanna to speak to that point, Autumn? Especially in the context of NTA maybe? Yeah, so um, if you haven't gotten Dr. Eve Ewing's book, Ghost in the Schoolyard, to understand exactly how school closings are a playbook in Chicago, um, it, it was really traumatic to read as a person who has gone through a, an attempted school closing um, because it is just literally done from a playbook here. Um, it is part of um, a removal process of uh, particularly black folks in Chicago. Um, we've seen black folks leave Chicago. If you look at the um, you know, census data of how much of our black population has been lost because of school closing, specifically from Rahm Emanuel, but also um, the disinvestment in communities and all those things that you also uh, pointed out, Steve, right? We see that here in Chicago. And, um, you know, my school is on, uh, on property that was part of, um, or is, let me say, is part of Chicago housing. Um, it was built when there were housing projects um, at, at that location, the Harold Icke Homes. And um, the people in the Harold Ickies when this building was built knew it was not for them. Literally said, when they said, your kids can go to school here, they're like, no way not for long. I mean, okay, but we know it's not for long. And so, um, you know, that push to remove students from NTA was done. Um, it was try. it was, it was attempted to be done repeatedly due to the changing of the neighborhood to being more white and more affluent. And they literally, um, told folks that they needed, needed a neighborhood high school in that location when the neighborhood high school that's assigned, um, is under, um, underpopulated, they have more seats than they can fill. Um, and instead of redrawing boundaries or, or funding a school to make it stronger for the community in Phillips, um, which has been historically underfunded as are most um, you know, under-enrolled schools, 
Um, they decided to remove young black kids to make way for richer and wealthier white folks who wanted their kid to be able to either drop, drop, uh, jump off the L at the green line or the red line or be able to walk from um, their homes. So, um, and the fight for that, and I think um, like when I hear um, Anastasia and Courtney talk, um, I think another part of that playbook um, that CPS is <laughs> doing a great job at is silencing parents. And when parents attempt to fight for what they know is their right, whether that's a neighborhood school or an improved quality of their child's education or a voice in that, um, the playbook is to, hey, we hear you, and then move on with the plan in, in the fashion of, we offered a space for your voice to be used, we do not listen to it, and we move forward with our plan. Um, and I think what happens to families, and, and I saw this at NTA when they were, you know, this is a community that has had their homes removed when they were removed from the Harold Dickies. They've seen themselves be replaced or uh, exited from their own community that they once um, held. And then when you go to these families and say, we need you now to fight, they're, what are they fighting? Because they've been fighting, they've been asking, they've been saying, and they're never listened to. So when even you try to, and I'm sure, um, you know, Courtney and Anastasia, as they're, as they're trying again to engage parents, are probably met with some of that from families who have, who have literally said we haven't been heard. We know we're not, like, so I also think that that idea of um, you know, families opting their children out of attendance and understanding how they have to impact where money goes uh, because Chicago Public School does not care about their voice. It does not care actually about their child's education. And, and to the point that Stephen was making about in Oakland, they do not make decisions based on education or people. They make decisions based on money. And so even things that don't let me also say this, don't make monetary sense, they will still do to appease a certain population. Instead of redrawing a, a school boundary for an overcrowded school, they will build an annex. Instead of mixing populations of, of children that are low income and wealthy, they will build a new school building. They will remove children. Um, so to really see those things happening, and, and again, we, we circle back, right, to this idea about humanity and people and, and what schools should be caring about, um, the fact that there is this corporate model, um, the fact that Chicago Public Schools has a CEO, <laughs> I mean, if that doesn't tell us the model that they are using, um, we, we aren't, uh, <laughs> seeing it, you know? So I think, um, you know, Anastasia, the, the other part of that playbook is, is the one that we've seen as well with just people in general, it's to divide. So if we don't allow the division, if we say, oh, no, no, we're, we're actually, I know I'm on a team with parents. Oh, no, no, no. I know I'm on a team with administrators. Oh, no, no. I know I'm on a team with neighbors. Then we, we can then start to, but to dismantle that corporate idea and that corporate model and that corporate power, because that's also what it is. It's corporate power that they hold. When a city runs a school district, which runs a, has a CEO who's picked by an unelected school board, I don't know how many other ways to slice it to say that that is not a community uh, that's not a community approach to education, to say the least. And I think the other part, when we look at the other ways that, um, and I think this was the point um, that I heard too from um, Mr. Noble, was this, this concept that they understand the power that those groups have. And to Michelle's point earlier, they see the power of the CTU and they want to do everything to divide that from each other, dividing teachers. If you look at the waves we went back in, they want to do it when they think about who is applying and getting a leave. They want to do it with families when they create this debate about is it safe or not. And I think the other thing is if you saw recently and WBEZ did an article about, and Michelle talked about this too, these folks who were out early on and were talking to families. Um, we are partners with families, right? Let me tell you, when a parent has a question, they don't call the CEO, they call the teacher. When a parent is concerned about something, they don't actually call the principal, they call the teacher. 
And so this partnership that they're also trying to dissolve because they see the strength. And so WBEZ just did a piece about how they want to, because of these folks, these, these brave and brilliant folks who were out early, did strategize, communicate, and work in community with families. CPS not only wants to punish those folks hard, they want to punish anyone who's going to continue to do that. They do not want teachers to be able to say, I already said earlier, testing season's coming up. You hear all of these people who are connected say, opt your kids out. Do you know how most folks find out about opting out? Their child's teacher. They find out because their child's teacher is like, as a parent, I want you to know your rights. I care about you. I care about our children. So when a school district with a CEO says, we need to stop the communication and the speech of teachers, what they are saying is, we see the strength that you all are holding, and we don't like that because we have the strength. And so as, as much as uh, I heard Anastasia say she's tired, keep going. Keep going because they are going to see that strength, and they see the strength, as Michelle pointed out, of teachers, right? That like those groups together, if we can you know, thundercat ourselves together and create the body, the arm, the head, the brain, we cannot be stopped. And so, um, you know, Lori Lightfoot ran on a, she wants an elected school board. We can name all the other things she ran on that doesn't, that she didn't do. But we, we also hold that power as voters, right? So like, I think the organization is what is hopeful for me because although we can say, yes, we're back in school. Yes, they didn't improve remote learning. Yes, we still don't have an elected school board. We can also say, as we collectively build this new vision of what we want for our city and for our children. And again, I'll refer to Karen Lewis because Karen Lewis had the uh, foresight to say, right? The schools that our children deserve. Um, if we continue to stand together in that notion and decide together what that is, it, it eventually won't matter because those people will be removed from the, from the force of, of all the people together. Thank you, Autumn. Definitely a lot of points to think about and good, well-made. Michelle, do you want to uh, follow up to that? I'd love to, and I, I'd like to, to wrap up and maybe have some like concluding ideas from hearing everybody. Um, First of all, I've, I've been uh, the longest serving member of the core steering, the caucus of rank, rank and file educators. So guess what that means? I got to spend every Sunday at Karen Lewis's dining room table for 10 years. And so the one thing I want to tell you is that for Anastasia and for Courtney, you know what she taught me the most? You have to teach people how to treat you. And so I, when I hear you talking, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing you saying, I'm going to teach CPS how to treat us as parents. So let's, let's take her spirit and carry that on. And then when I hear from Adam, keep capturing what is human, I'm, I'm thinking of myself personally. Um, I, I believe in Maria Montessori and in uh, developmentally appropriate education for children, a free education, as Adam said. And I'm going to follow the child in these next 16 weeks I'm with them. It is not their fault that we've been forced into this situation. And I'm going to try to bring as much joy into it as I can. Now I can't make a wave a magic wand and make it all perfect, but I will try to lead with my heart, follow them and lead with joy because I refuse to be dehumanized in this moment. Um, and I wanna to say to all of us, this will not be our last pandemic or crisis. So this conversation we are having here today is actually really important. And the political education that we put forward, I believe is going to make a difference. Um, and I wanna talk also to what Courtney was saying and to, because I think when we bring awareness, we're actually helping everybody understand how to move forward, right? And Courtney, what you were bringing up that they're asking all of us, children, parents, families, teachers, to take huge, incredible risk for a worse plan. Who, who says that this is okay? But we have to keep telling people they've created something worse and they're asking us to risk for it. Um, 
And I then the, my last point that I want to make is about my context where I teach. I teach on the North Shore uh, in Lakeview in a, in a school where the parents are privileged and you don't own a million and a half dollar um, townhouse by having treated other people really well all your life. It's usually at, um, at the expense of others, right? And um, there is, there are a lot of people who have gotten where they are by always getting their way. And I do want to call out the parents who have, whose actions have harmed others and want us to identify it and talk about it. Um, for some of the parents who I've had to work with and who have dehumanized me in this moment, almost unforgivably, except I know Adam Gottlieb and so I forgive. Um, you know, I, 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 I see like we, we can figure out the forgiveness part of it, but um, let's, let's identify white shield when we see it. Let's let people know that you don't think anything wrong will happen to your child or your family because you've been untouched by all of it. You are living underneath a white shield. So call that out, identify it, name it, let people know about it. They don't even know it exists. This is political education right now. The next part of political education that I, I heard many of us speak, Shamako speak about it and Peter, is what opportunity hoarding is. And a parent who wants their child to go to school now because they are falling behind and get ahead and they have to have the best school, the best um, of everything, I will write my check, open up my checkbook and write the check. That is opportunity hoarding. I actually had a parent call me up and say, I'll buy you a better air purifier. As if that would take, oh, that, that would be all it would take to make this all okay. So when we see opportunity hoarding, call it out, name it, and let people know. I, th I think there's actually, we were talking about this um, when we were talking about the elites, and I think this was coming from you, Stephen. You know, I think that the person who offered me a, an air purifier actually thought he was being a good person. He actually thought he was doing something for me, right? And then I, the last parent conversation I want to bring up and talk about was where a um, a parent mentioned that their child was suffering. Both of these parents are still working. They are housed, they have food, their child is learning. I actually see incredible happiness in this child. We have to watch when people weaponize suffering. Now there are people, this has not been good. We have, it is horrid. This is not how any of us wanna live our lives but we have to watch when people weaponize suffering. So those are my three things. I wanna, I wanna say them again, cause like point them up, talk about it. White shield, opportunity hoarding and weaponizing suffering. Thank you, Michelle. I definitely am gonna note those terms. Um, Excellent. I just wanted to myself, I just wanted to bring, oh, we have Peter saying all that wealth, all that philanthropy giving is money that was not paid in taxes, which would fully nationally fund public education. Excellent point. Yes. I, I just wanted to touch on something that came up in the chat a, a long time ago, but I just found it to be really powerful when um, I, it was Peter who noted after Anastasia talked about the way they were um, keeping the kids out. Um, Peter mentioned this being similar to some things that SNCC had done um, long ago. And Courtney brought up the 63 parent boycott, you know, here. And so I just wondered, I know I really appreciate Lou saying earlier, and I know Adam pointing out, we need to focus on our students right now, the situation right now. But I wonder if there is something that we can think about as some of these previous organizations have set in motion and even if we feel like they maybe, you know, aren't as acted out as strongly as they were before. I don't know, is there something that some of these organizations have done in the past that maybe we could also learn from and think about 
and adjust if needed, but just kind of think about them and, and what they did. So that was the only thing. Um, oh, thank you, Anastasia, for getting those, uh, those terms up there. Okay, so um, we just want to open it up. Um, people have questions, comments, um, open the floor. I actually, I'm sorry, I'm calling myself. I've been thinking about um, how to unite efforts and unity is so important. And one of the things that struck me was when Autumn was talking about opting out of tests. Is that something then parents can also get behind who are organizing the sick outs to give power to that? Because I agree, those standardized testing, I don't even know what the hell they're for, quite honestly, other than metrics, because they don't say anything about the kid's intelligence. It just speaks to, you know, they're able to take tests well. And my kids take tests well. But it's a call BS, you know, um, but like the, the goals for the March 1st sick out, how can those be united also with the teacher's goals? Because I think all of us agree that return to that it's not a safe plan, right? How are we going to be able to to push Lori Lightfoot or whomever so that we do get the best safe learning possible? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's it's and, and cause this fight's not over, even even if the strike didn't happen, what ifs this fight is not over. And I, I think you're right. This is just like the beginning, right? We're gonna see long-term effects from this pandemic and how the ruling class are are not keeping us in mind by any means. So I don't know if maybe somebody can speak to that. I can speak uh, to it, it briefly. Um, you mentioned about sick out. Um hey Sue, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, we're brief because I know I'm long-winded. Um, regarding a sick out, um, well, it was only like six, seven of us that actually were the core people that planned it. Um, we had two days, two, three days to really like push everything through. I mean, we were busy, like on phones, emails, back and forth. <laughs> we hardly had any sleep. And there was almost a 10% um, decrease in student as uh, far as that, that was as far as attendance, that was less than ten percent of students, almost ten percent, that didn't attend, uh, attend school uh, last time we did the sick out. I think it was February first. So that says a lot that we had a very short time to organize. We push it forth and everything else. It was so. This is how we know that it made an impact. Um, the mayor actually did. Hey, mommy, I'm sorry, my daughter. <laughs> Um, actually did um, uh, called us uh, uh, like an emergency Zoom meeting. And one of her board yeah. members reached out to us and was like, look, they, it shook them up because again, they weren't expecting parents to, to do anything. So the fact that just a small amount of us parents made that big impact. Now I'm sure all of it went just for us, you know, the children that were out anyway that day. That's However, cool. but the fact that they see that there was somebody listening to us that's out here for our parents and not being very organized. Imagine <laughs> if we get very organized and we have more groups, more people, more organizations saying, hey, since you're gonna put our, since our uh, teachers are under contract and have a union, so they're limited on what they can do because they can get fired from their jobs. But parents, what you gonna do to us? You know, and as far as them, they're gonna have a whole lot of lawsuits if they try to do anything to us parents because they can't control into physical, spiritual, emotional health. I'm, I'm my son's care professional, you know, his health, his second health, because, you know, he can't be here because, of course, the quarantine. So I'm, my, I'm doing all the extra things <laughs> that um, as a parent that we have to do to be able to keep our children safe and healthy. So that is how we do it. We, we, we the father sick out, you ask, like, you know, how do we go about doing it? That's how we did it. We, we didn't think any, about anything else because our, the consequence was our child or children being sick or the people who are sending our, our friends that have to go to work that are sending their children to school, they have no choice because they don't have a babysitter, you know, or they don't have the help or whatever. So like you said, they're using that, like you said, Autumn, as uh, it even Courtney, like every, they're using that like as a babysitter, you know, if they're, they're babysitters and stuff. So. Michelle, you hit it on the nail. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, um, you don't understand a struggle unless you, you've gone through it. You know, and I have friends that can empathize with me that don't have children that are still very supportive, but it's something about being a parent. 
And actually understanding that point of view is something totally different. You have to care for someone else's well-being. So yeah, the sick out um, on coming in a few days on Monday, uh, we're, we're, we're expecting every month to keep growing, to keep growing and growing and growing because even if you know everything goes back to, it's, it's not normal. We're in a pandemic. They keep making it seem like it's normal. There's nothing normal. <laughs> we can dress up and act like we're normal, everything's normal, but I know a lot of people who are dealing with even parents as well as students dealing with serious mental health issues, serious emotional issues. And I even had one of my cousins, she was like, well, I want my normalcy back. <laughs> okay, well, you do what you have to do. I respect that. But what is normal? Because it's not, you want to go back to work. It's never going to be normal. You have a big terminal you're going to have. <laughs> you know, it's never going to be back the same ever again. Nowhere in this country is going to be the same. You know, we are forever changed. You know, so um, again, you know, it, it just, we all just have to and, and do our own part, play our own part uh, with all of this. I just want to wrap my part up. So I'm just my last time talking. I just want to say that again, parent voices matter. We have a Facebook page. We have our sick out page, sick out Facebook page. If anyone wants to join, thank you, uh, Dr. Estrada. I okay. saw your name up on there for also being, you know, um, joining us and just supporting us and just saying, hey, I see what you all are doing and I support you. So right now we're just getting our momentum going. But um, I just want to say thank you, everybody on the panel. You all have, um, I have like a whole bunch of notes here. <laughs> like you all told me even a lot of things today. And I'm very thankful to always be in a company of, you know, of people who care, who have the knowledge, education, and everything behind it, who you can learn from anyone, you know. So, um, like I said, come join us. Post those um, links, Anastasia, so people can see where they're at. Those Facebook links, if you can. So, I, okay, I, uh, it just reminded me this the event goes to three o'clock. I got confused because I run my meetings until three thirty. Um, and I don't know if anybody else wants to do some quick party shots. Patrick is going to speak, and we're gonna close out with a poem. This has been outstanding. <clears throat> All right, Patrick, do you want to um, talk about the league? Yes, um, absolutely. Thank you all so much uh, for this conversation. Um, as a, a, a young person, relatively 23, um, but also as a future educator myself, I think that uh, um, I, I, I'm leaving this conversation really, really um, fired up and, and you know inspired and uh, angry, um, you know, but uh, righteous anger. And um, so, you know, um, having said that, uh, what I want to do now is uh, just quickly talk about the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. Um, we, we basically do stuff like this. Uh, we bring together um, the, the, the leaders in the fight for basic needs. Um, we, are, we are all members of the working class coming from an assortment of backgrounds and experiences we are social, political, and class conscious individuals working to elevate the consciousness of our class and to influence the transformation to a cooperative society, a society that can and must be based on the public ownership of the necess necessities of life and the distribution of goods according to need. Our mission is to connect with and unite the scattered freedom fighters and demands of a growing class of workers that are demanding food, quality housing, education, and health care, and a safe future, a growing class of workers that can no longer survive in a corporate private pro in a system of corporate private property and endless oppression. We use study and analysis as our tools. We use education as our weapon to mobilize and engage in the battle of ideas. We struggle in real time in the streets, in the encampments, in the workplaces, and everywhere else we can. The Rally Comrades uh, is a publication and website provided that which provides uh, up to date articles, statements and analysis of the key questions and events of importance to the people. We encourage you all to check us out and subscribe to the Rally Comrades at rallycomrades.org. Uh, I will also here plug in the People's Tribune. Um, the People's Tribune covers the same thing and, and does similar things. Um, at one speaking event is the, the one time that I, I met um, Karen Lewis um, at a People's Tribune event. Um, so just wanted to plug that in and 
check the People's Tribune out as well. And you know, we invite you all to, to join us in this struggle for change. To be a member is to accept the program, unite around the fight for basic needs, study and learn from one another, and realize a vision to secure the fight, to secure the future for humanity and our planet. Uh, you could contact us at learna.org and the Learna Chicago, uh, the Facebook page. And uh, thank you all for coming out today. Happy full moon. Um, and I hope you all can go out and enjoy the beautiful weather and yeah, solidarity. Thank you all. Awesome. Adam, you want to close us out? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, I'll close out with a poem that uh, folks, uh, my lead comrades asked me to do Pedagogy of the Poets. I also wrote it in the 2012 teacher strike, not the 1912, uh, not to be confused. Um, and uh, I won't say much because it's uh, not a short poem, maybe four minutes. I won't be offended if people have to go. Okay, it does start with a couple quotes from uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. Um, Education either functions as an instrument which is used to facilitate integration of the younger generation into the logic of the present system and bring about conformity, or it becomes the practice of freedom, the means by which men and women deal critically and creatively with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. This then is the great humanistic and historical task of the oppressed to liberate themselves and their oppressors as well. Pedagogy of the poets. This is our classroom, this cipher, this circle, this open mic to amplify our voices, this talking stick, this ritual, this space where we are all teachers and students and our conversation is the lesson. Voices and dialogue, concert, testimonies, meeting, alchemizing in the air. This is our eternal truth, our only theory, our sacred text ever changing. We are movement, evolution, truly human being praxis. We practice the art of speaking and listening. The word and the silence are the legs on which we walk. The word to name ourselves and the world. The silence to hear what others are saying. The word to know, to defend, to dream. Silence, soil to receive these seeds. This is the garden, the ecosystem. This is art and age old wisdom. This is the theater. This is the stage. This is the altar on which we pray. This is our church and our town hall, our Congress and congregational. This is our government. We are the legislators. This is our classroom. We are the educators. Capitalist pedagogy works top down. Study for the test, listen up, shut your mouth. Standardized curricula written by the state, memorizing disconnected facts for a grade. Keep it compartmentalized. Don't connect the dots. Teach them to be satisfied with the poverty they got. Never use the word oppression. That's unpatriotic. Don't teach ethnic studies or you'll go to jail. Got it? Water down the history. Literature, social studies, out with creativity. We don't need critical thinkers, do we? In a system where the vast majority of jobs are to slave away for minimum wage working for a boss. But something new is happening. Now even that is gone. Automated labor has created a new problem. They don't even need us in their factories no more, but they do need us in warehouses so they can win their war. So they close the public schools when they wanna make a buck. But when COVID puts our lives at risk, they do not give a fuck. They say we gotta open schools up, the ones we haven't closed, cause we don't care if you live or die and where else would you go? Maybe jail, maybe prison maybe concentration camps, while they beef up the police state and they bail out the banks, closing clinics, building condos, putting people on the street. That's the kind of education we gonna get from the elite. If this shit ain't fucking fascist, well then I don't know what is. Tyranny of corporations, slavery inc. Light footin' buddies up in city hall huddle like a pack of vicious vultures to callously shutter up another housing project till there's not even one left. Selling public schools for a charter paycheck. Packing 50 students in a class with old books, cutting back special ed, art and music go first, then it's nurses, counselors, janitors, lunch is gross meat soon enough. They're sitting in a room with no heat, but it's all about the kids, right? Lori's on our side. It's not her fault we've got an education. 
educational apartheid. It's got to be the teachers. Them motherfuckers lazy. Better bust their unions up, cut their payment, raise fees, call me crazy. But I think I see a pattern. They're taking away our basic needs while they keep getting fatter. Their politics are like their classes, just monologue. Turning schools into prison, soft holocaust. All of us now have to make a decision. Keep trying to fix a broken capitalist system or redesign society. Unite for a new vision where everyone participates and everybody listens. This is why we make a space for everyone to talk. This is what democracy looks like, hip hop. This is our pedagogy. This is why we rock the mic and we pass it so the cypher don't stop. Thank you. Teach your children well Cause their father's hell Did slowly go by And feed them on your dreams The one they fix The one you know by